Okay, everybody. Good afternoon. I think we're about ready to get started. Uh, our one housekeeping note is uh, Michael asked me to remind everybody that both sessions are recorded. So if you're here uh, as, a, as a paid attendee, you can have access to a video of what's going on in the other room. So you don't have to miss anything by being here. I think this is going to be a more fun session anyway. Um, because I can't help myself, uh, I just thought I'd put a few words to paper uh, and then transcribe it onto an, kind of an introductory slide for everybody. Uh, I can send this around later if you, if, if you don't want to, to read it right now. Um, I'll go over it very quickly. Um, this is my personal opinion. Um, I'm a pharmacognosist by training. Uh, and have been doing analytical chemistry for a while. And um, as far as I'm concerned, um, DNA uh, technology, is in, it's an exciting technology. This is a kind of an exciting time to be alive. Um, but it's just a technology. It's just a tool. Um, you know, there's nothing magical about it. It's not CSI. You don't walk a sample from one end to into a bench top and have the results when you arrive at the other end of the bench top. Um, just don't work that way. I don't watch crime procedural uh, dramas on TV because I find myself yelling at the screen. Um, so, DNA analysis is basically a qualitative analytical chemistry tool used primarily by researchers to establish relatedness of organisms along the tree of life continuum. Um, it's a lot more advanced in uh, mammalian uh, uh, sequencing, uh, identification of animals. Uh, in some ways, animals are simpler than plants. Plants are kind of complicated and all sorts of other words. Um, so there has been considerable success in using DNA technologies in animal research. Plants were still at the frontier. Uh, the technology can characterize a certain type of macromolecule for the purpose of fitting a biological entity into a man-made construct called a taxon. Now, I went over this with some folk before, the, be, before this meeting, and um, uh, Damon reminded me that there are botanists and molecular biologists who, who will fight over the idea of whether a, a species, the species concept is man-made or if it's actually something real in nature. So that's a different controversy, so we won't go into that right now. Uh, depending on experimental design, the taxonomic unit to which a specimen can be, be assigned using this technology is sometimes to the family level, sometimes to the genus level, and others, and for this industry, and most usefully, it's the species level. These are the three different levels of taxa. Uh, for the purpose of this afternoon's session, DNA analysis will be discussed in the context of its utility as a tool for regulatory compliance. Uh, when it's used for that reason, it's used in a manner similar to how, for instance, an HPTLC fingerprint might be used. It's an identity technique, it's a technique, it's a tool. Performance of the method and suitability for its intended use can be established using internationally accepted pro approaches provided by IUPAC, uh, in, in International Standards uh, Organization, AOAC International, and others, exactly the same way as is done for other types of analytical chemistry techniques. So it's not magic. Uh, it's not really all that much more complicated to, than doing uh, LC tandem mass spec on small, uh, small molecules. It's just we don't know quite as much at this point on how to use it and how reliable it is. So I'll end my part there, uh, except for the moderating and, and, uh, of questions and things like that. That's pretty much the most you're going to hear about me from me today. Um, so our first speaker is Damon Little. Now, there are very nice and very succinct bios in the, the, the little brochure of each person, and I'm not going to read those because the time is for them, not for me, to do reading. So without any further delay, I'll introduce Damon. Welcome, Damon. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. So before I actually talk much about DNA barcoding I want to, and DNA identification, I want to talk a bit about the discipline in which I come from, which is probably a bit different from what most of you do. I'm a plant systematist. Um, systematics is really the science of biological diversity. We're the people who 
construct and uh, apply Latin names, mostly to annoy you. Um, this is governed by the International Code of Botanic Nomenclature, and in truth, this is closer to law than it is to science. There is a bit of science that comes into it, but this particular part of it is following the rules. We, as plant systematists, also work heavily on diagnostics. Um, mostly, these are tools to differentiate between things. Um, sometimes these are morphological measurements, keys um, that you may be used to using, and increasingly, DNA technology. Um, one of the other things we study is phylogeny, which is a reconstruction of the evolutionary history of organisms. And this is particularly important when it comes to diagnostics in terms of how to sample, and I'll get into that in a bit. And lastly, we study speciation and hybridization. Um, mostly this is um, learning about how things came to be, but it's also learning about how they come back together again. And this informs both our reconstruction of phylogeny um, and our diagnostic tools. Now, most disciplines have their gold standards. In our case, besides publications, which you're used to pretty much every academic discipline having, we have specimens. In the case of plants, they look like this. They're pressed and dried, glued to sheets of paper, filed away. The place I work at, the New York Botanical Garden, has almost 8 million of these. Um, these specimens tell us quite a bit, and they're more important than simply a piece of reference material. They are the evidence that you've done any work. Um, you may have heard the internet rule pictures where it didn't happen. In the case of plant systematics, it's specimens where it doesn't exist. Um, if you take a specimen, you can get all sorts of interesting things from it. Of course, we can take measurements directly. We can examine it microscopically. We can sequence the DNA from it. Um, and we can examine the metadata. And this metadata is quite important, particularly the place that it was collected from and the time it was collected. Um, it's important to note that most of the data we publish comes from the specimens themselves. Sometimes it comes from other tissues that were collected at the same time the specimen was collected. Um, but when you publish, you have to make clear the relationship between the thing that you got the data from and the specimen itself, whether or not this is part of the same tree, for instance, that the data was collected from, or is it any other tree in the population that you're assuming to be identical but isn't necessarily so. If you look at one specimen, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot when it comes down to it. And so that's why most plant systematic studies look at several hundred specimens. And when you look at a whole number of specimens like this, pretty soon trends start to emerge in the data. And these trends eventually coalesce into patterns. And these patterns are really what plant systematists study. So in this case, this is the pattern of distribution of a particular species in the state of Alaska and adjacent Canada. If you publish this particular thing in a plant systematics journal, you have to give a citation of a specimen for every single one of those dots. In many cases, it's several specimens for each one of those dots. And you have to discuss why there are no dots over there in the middle, mostly because people don't go there. Um, but you, know, you have to explain the distribution. We also look at things like the phenology, how you tell things apart based on when they're reproducing, when they're producing leaves. And probably most importantly, we describe species. Um, this is an example of a species description. If you know how to read these, you can learn pretty much everything you need to know about the plant in terms of how to identify it morphologically, how it looks different from its close relatives, and what characteristics are important. As I said, we also get the phylogeny. And oftentimes, you'll see papers by plant systematists obsessed with a particular morphological character and its relevance to some abiotic factor. And, you know, they will go on and on about that. But again, they're specimens to document it. So you might ask why someone who is kind of so imbibed in morphology would want to do DNA identification. Well, the short answer is it gets you all to leave us alone. Um, by identifying a few specimens, we can allow other people to identify them to the same accuracy without actually having to do anything ourselves. Of course, we also face um, specimens that are difficult to identify, powders, things that are closer to mulch than they are um, to a whole plant. And this is where DNA techniques really shine. Um, DNA-based identification is rather simple when it comes down to it. The first thing you have to do is extract DNA. And sometimes this is completely trivial. Sometimes it isn't. It depends on your um, technique and what you're starting with. 
And then you have to prepare the samples for sequencing. Now, depending on the particular protocol that you're going to use, this um, is radically different. But generally, for Sanger sequencing, what you'll do is a um, PCR of a targeted marker and then purify that for sequencing. If you're doing one of the next generation methods, you typically will fragment the DNA first and then add some linkers to the end of it and then do a PCR um, enrichment of the ligated linker bits and then put it on the machine for sequencing. Once you have the sequence, you actually need to use computers to make a comparison between the sequence and a reference database. And the reason why I say you need a computer to do it is it gets complicated quickly. So you've probably heard the term DNA barcoding, and I slip back and forth between barcoding and identification, and I apologize if I don't use them um, the way I'm going to tell you you should be using them. Um, <laughs> so barcoding versus DNA identification. All um, DNA barcoding is DNA identification, but not um, all DNA identification is barcoding. Barcoding requires that there is a standard public database, in this case GenBank, um, run by the National Institutes of Health. There's a keyword that you can see in a GenBank record that's barcode in all caps, indicating that it's a barcode record. Um, these sequences, as I'll discuss on the next slide, really are only high quality and of particular regions for plants. They connect to an expertly identified um, voucher specimen. And this part is important. If there's no voucher, the sequence can't get a barcode record. And the expert is in quotes because, well, frankly, anyone can call themselves an expert. The point is that the voucher specimen has to be in a public collection. So anyone else can go there and look at it and say, no, you're not the expert. I am, and it's this. People fight about these things. Um, then um, the other part about it is that if you're doing DNA barcoding, there are kind of standard sets of protocols that one can use or at least leverage, um, making it somewhat easier in many cases. The barcode requirement basically requires that it is the right marker. For animals, that's cytochrome oxidase 1. For fungi, that's the internal transcribed spacer of the nuclear ribosomal DNA. And for plants, it's both MATK and RBCL2 plastid genes. Um, the sequence is not necessarily the entire gene. It's usually a portion of it, and so it has to be the right portion. Um, the sequences have to be of high enough quality to pass the thresholds required, and you have to deposit the raw data in GenBank, so you can't simply say my sequence was of high quality, you actually have to prove it with the raw data. Um, and of course, the voucher specimen has to exist. Now, if you're not going to do DNA barcoding, you're going to pick some segment of DNA to look at, or some part of the genome, you might ask, which one? Well, generally speaking, you want something that's high copy number, and this is because it's easy to work with. Um, if you have a sample and you have a high copy number, you don't have to make as many copies of it to do the next thing that you're going to do. And you will be making copies of it. Um, this also means that if you have a sample with degraded DNA, you're much more likely to be able to find the high copy parts in the degraded sample than you are to find the low copy parts. You also need something that is universal. Um, Plant genomes are essentially a black box. We know a handful of species very well. There are 80 supposedly fully sequenced plant genomes. Most of those, to be quite frank, aren't fully sequenced. They're mostly sequenced. Um, and outside of that, we know nothing. There are 400,000 other species of plants, approximately. And as a result, you need to be able to say, see this part of the DNA I'm looking at? It's X. And in order to do that, you need something that is conserved um, that you can recognize. You also need kind of the converse property, something that's variable enough that you can actually tell closely related species apart. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit. The other thing, you need to make absolutely sure that you're comparing things across the data set in a manner that's comparable. Um, the stereotypical way of saying this is an apples to apples comparison. Plant genomes are very complicated. You have to be careful you're comparing the right copy um, across your specimens. So the first place that you can look for high copy DNA is the mitochondrion, um, shown here in a false color TEM. They're really not this pretty. Um, for animals, this is where the cytochrome oxidase is. For plants, I mean, it's there. It's just not so useful. There are many spacers, introns, and insertions. And a lot of these introns and insertions actually come from other parts of the genome, usually the plastid, sometimes the nuclear genome. 
The size varies quite a lot from 187 to 2,400 kilobases. This is practical to deal with, but a little bit annoying because that kind of size variation makes it difficult to compare things oftentimes. And fortunately, there are a limited number of genes, usually 50 to 60, and they're relatively conserved in both their sequence and their function. This is good because you can spot them. It's bad because they're useless for identification for the most part. Mitochondria are uniparentally inherited, usually, um, and that's usually maternal, which means that if you have a hybrid, you could have a hybrid plant right in front of you and not be able to tell because it has the sequence of its mother, which if the father is the other species, you're not going to know it. Um, and this has this kind of confounding effect of lowering the rate of sequence evolution, and I'll explain that in two slides, so just hold that thought. The other source of high copy DNA is the plastid, and I've put two pictures up here deliberately of plastids. You often hear people talk about chloroplast DNA. Please don't say that. I beg of you. Um, the plastid has three major morphs. There are more, but there are three that are most common. The first is the chloroplast, the nice green one you see there. The second is the chromoplast, in this case a red one. It's what gives you know, your red pepper its red color or your carrots their orange color or purple color or whatever color your carrots happen to be. And there are leucoplasts, which are usually white, um, hard to see without staining, but they're what you know, make your potatoes starchy, for instance. All of these are the same organelle. They all have the same DNA. And this particular morph changes. So the chloroplast can become a chromoplast in a very short period of time developmentally. So it's, just say plastid DNA, please. It's, you're never going to get just chloroplast DNA, no matter how hard you try. Um, so about 10% of your average DNA extraction, more or less, is um, plant plastid DNA, which means that it's very easy to work with, for the most part. It's a pretty stable genome structure. There are plenty of exceptions, but they're kind of interesting because they're rare. Um, there isn't a lot of variation within species. And typically, like the mitochondrion, this is uniparentally inherited from the mother. And again, it masks the hybrids and slows the rate of sequence evolution. So now to explain that. Imagine for a moment you have two species, a red one and a blue one. And like most plant species, they're mostly separate, but they have a little bit of permeability between them. So that's what the dotted line down the middle represents. Now these two species have um, pretty good dispersal. So the red one is entirely red. The blue one is entirely blue. If we get a little bit of outcrossing, um, hybridization from the red one into the blue one, it will, of course, get some of the red DNA over there. But because there's this high degree of interchange between populations, between blue populations, um, in a short period of time, that red DNA just disappears, typically. And so whenever you happen to observe these species, you'll say, oh, they're two very good species. They're all red or all blue. I can always tell them apart. Now, let's look at the contrasting situation. We have two species, again, semi-permeable barrier, but this time they don't have particularly good um, distribution or dispersal among populations. So we get some differentiation. We have shades of pink and shades of blue, um, which look bluer on my screen than up there, but, you know. If we get an integration event, again, we'll get some of the pink DNA over into the purple dots. Um, but one of the interesting things that happens with this is sometimes that DNA sticks around and actually spreads. So if you were to look at the species at this period of time, you'll say it's actually not a very good species because sometimes it has pink DNA and sometimes it has blue, right? Well, the sad part is this is how plants operate normally. And you think that this is one species, but both things can be going on in the same plant at the same time. The one on the left can be the nuclear genome. The one on the right can be the plastid genome. This is very, very common. Um, this is why plastid DNA is difficult to use in the end. So if you want to run away and use the last remaining genomic compartment, the nucleus, there's only really one source of high copy DNA in the nucleus. It's the nuclear ribosomal DNA. And you can actually see it if you stain your um, chromosomes just right. That's what the arrow represents there. Um, because this DNA is repeated over and over again. And to be quite honest, it's closer to medium copy number than high, but you know we're trying to say the best we can about it, right? 
There are conserved and variable portions of the RDNA. Um, this is good because you can find your landmarks and then look at your variable sequence. The problem is that the sequence quality tends to be relatively low no matter what sequence technology you use. And that's because these pieces of DNA, their function is to have secondary structure. They do have secondary structure, and that gets in the way of a lot of our sequencing technology. Um, the other thing to be concerned about is we would like to think plants exist as a single organism that is just a plant, but it's not. Um, any plant part you get is going to be covered in fungi um, epiphytically. Most plants are going to have fungi in their roots connecting them, and most plants also have fungi growing through their stems and into their leaves as endophytes. So pretty much whatever you do, you're going to get a little bit of fungi with your plant. Um, this becomes a problem um, because people can't necessarily universally tell the plant DNA from the fungal DNA. And the evidence that I would suggest is this. If you look in GenBank, about a quarter of the sequences labeled as plant RDNA are actually fungi. So just so you know. Um, there is a, um, because the RDNA is repeated, each repeat basically acts as a separate locus. And there's a process called concerted evolution, which homogenizes the repeats. And sometimes it works beautifully, the repeats are completely homogenized, and you can pretend that the RDNA is uniparentally inherited. In other plants, the concerted evolution doesn't work quite as well, and you can't make that um, assumption. It's not um, quite clear what's going on, and so your data analysis becomes troubled. Um, not to say it's impossible, but it becomes more difficult than it needs to be. So the rest of the plant DNA that is not high copy in the nuclear genome is we usually refer to as low copy. Sometimes you hear people say single copy, and I would argue that's not really the correct because pretty much every plant duplicates most of its genes in tandem repeats, particularly genes that are useful for something. Um, so you'll find things that'll be three or four copies altogether, usually all the same, which makes your life easy, but nonetheless, they're usually not just one copy. We also, as you probably know, plants hybridize. They have something called polyploidy, so you get the genome duplicating in part or a whole. So this also complicates um, your observation. Plant genomes are, frankly, full of a lot of stuff we don't know what it does. Um, a lot of it is spacers, introns, insertions. Some of this is bits of the plastid genome, the mitochondrial genome, and a huge part of it is transposable elements. Um, you can think of these as failed viruses, um, failed retroviruses that have incorporated into the DNA and stick around. You might know them from the thing that makes Indian corn have all those pretty colors. Um, but nonetheless, there they are, and they complicate things. In terms of plant genome size, it's pretty variable, um, from 63 megabase pairs to about 150. So this is a bit smaller than human and way, way, way bigger. Um, there are typically about 30,000 genes, um, so that part is good, which, by the way, is about the same number of genes in most mammals, so don't think plants are simple just because they're not walking around attacking you. Okay. Now, you've decided that you still want to do this after I've uh, said all of that. <laughs> there are basically two kinds of assays that you can design. The first one we'll call assay A is the question, is species X present in the sample? And it could be more than X. It could be a short list, right? But you have a circumscribed list. The second question you might be able to ask, we'll say question B, is what species are present in a sample? And you might think of these as being the same question. They are, of course, related. But I would argue that these are two actually very different questions when it comes to assay design. Um, in my opinion, and this really is just my opinion, but I hope someone will prove me wrong, but I doubt they ever will, um, I don't think you can actually design a good assay for B. You can do one, a great assay for A. You can really go whole hog and make something that's almost perfect. But when it comes to B, you really can't. Um, that's because A is a very well circumscribed. You can figure out what all the possible combinations of things are, what kind of mixtures you could have, um, all sorts of presence or absences, and actually test every last one of them. B, it's a little bit too big for that. And like I said, there are 400,000 species of plants. Most of them are very poorly known. You can, for A, include negative and positive controls. And if you design the positive controls correctly, you can unambiguously know what's going on with your sample. Um, so you're, 
assay can be both very specific and very precise. B, on the other hand, you can really only include negative controls. And negative controls are very useful, don't get me wrong, but the problem is that negative controls only have a certain, shall we say, span of applicability. A negative control can tell you whether or not the sample has become contaminated from the time it arrived in the lab till the time you did the assay. But it can't tell you if it got contaminated in the field, that kind of thing. So you're going to design this assay. The first question you have to, you have to ask yourself is, are there adequate references available? And you need these to be public voucher specimens. I know other disciplines don't require voucher specimens or they even be public or even disclose where you got them from. Um, but I would argue that the plant systematics community has learned from its mistakes of many years ago, we're talking the 1700s, not having voucher specimens and we have corrected our ways and since um, 1753 we've maintained you need vouchers. Um, we've learned something, I hope you can learn from us. These vouchers should be expertly identified um, and poor, you know, publicly available so other experts can weigh in if necessary. You need to sample enough individuals to estimate two things. The first thing is the variation within the species that you're targeting. If you can't do that, um, you're in trouble. The second thing that you need to estimate is you need to try to estimate the variation among species. And this is where um, question A and question B come in. It's easy to estimate the variation among species when it's a short list. It's really hard when you're talking all 400,000 plants. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, one of the most important things, and you see it all the time published, um, assays where people sample a single species and they say, see, this works to identify it. And a plant systematist says, no, it doesn't. Um, that's because you need to make sure that you've sampled um, all the close relatives. Evolution actually does matter, um, whether you want to believe in it or not. Um, you also need to sample um, all the things that people say look alike. And I'm using look alike here in the most liberal and positive sense, which is to say things people have put into a container and labeled the other thing, whether they actually look alike or not. Um, and lastly, you actually have to ask yourself this question, can the target species actually be consistently told apart? Um, I've seen a number of assays published where it's very clear from a table or a figure that they can't be told apart, yet the assay says they can. And then people go on to use that assay. It's sort of disturbing. People don't want to read the paper, can't read the paper, I don't know. Um, so there are two aspects to sampling. The first is the phylogenetic, and that's what we'll talk about first. So, for instance, we want to sample um, Actea racemosa, the black cohosh. There it is. Here is the evolutionary history as inferred from um, several different loci and some morphological characteristics. So, taxonomically, it says that we need to sample everything in the section that it belongs to. So that's everything highlighted in blue. Um, the phylogeny, which is why you need a phylogeny. If you don't have a phylogeny, you should just stop. Um, and develop one before proceeding the, in the assay, honestly. Suggests that we also need to sample another species in this case. Um, it happens to be in a different section. Doesn't really matter for the assay. The point is that you need all of the common, an you need the species that you're interested in, all of its common ancestors, descendants, and things that led to it. So you can be absolutely certain that any variation that you are detecting is unique to that species. You also, as I said, need to sample the things that people sometimes include um, as the species that are not. Now, the sample size, the other aspect of sampling. There are a lot of ways to do this. I can present you the sort of textbook method, which is the population genetics textbook method, which is you estimate the number of haplotypes after doing some sampling and see if you've sampled enough um, to get them all. So basically you just have to know how many variants you got and how many things you've sampled um, for say two things that you've sampled. If you get eight, um, you have a relatively high probability of seeing it, having seen everything. Now this makes a huge assumption. It assumes that plants are sort of like a um, fish bowl full of golf balls of different colors, right? And there's some blue ones and some red ones and if you scoop out eight of them, you will get at least one red one and one blue one. Unfortunately, plants are not um, so distributed. 
Um, generally, you need a lot more samples, and this is because plants tend to be geographically structured. Um, so you need to sample across the geographic range to make sure you're getting everything. There's also um, structure that often happens phenologically or morphologically, so you need to sample that as well. Tissue. Um, basically, I would argue that if you thought of this as an exercise in going to the grocery store, if you click the tissue that you would be willing to eat, this is usually the tissue that has good DNA in it as sort of a rule of thumb. Um, you're looking for tissue that is well-preserved. Um, things that dry rapidly typically have the right color, which doesn't always work, but, you know, it's a good indicator sometimes. It doesn't look like it was, say, smashed and bruised, um, not infected by huge numbers of fungi, um, viruses, etc. And also looks relatively homogeneous. If it's heterogeneous, you're going to have trouble with your data analysis. I would recommend that you actually try to make your samples homogeneous as possible. That might mean sitting down with a pair of forceps and a microscope, but I think it pays off in the end. Um, the less of a mixture you have, the easier it is to understand what it is you're dealing with. Um, the next talk is going to deal mo with DNA hardiness extensively, so I'm just going to very quickly go through this, which is just to say that DNA is destroyed when it's not in living tissue. And the... Um, Things that can happen um, make it difficult to sequence no matter how you work. Basically, smaller fragments survive processing better than larger fragments. And things like heat, freeze-thaw cycles, wet-dry cycles, and liquid um, preserve, um, especially when it's, say, an oil, um, generally mean that it's very difficult to recover DNA. Now, you can get DNA out of anything if you're, shall we say, resourceful enough, maybe, but it certainly becomes more difficult the more of these things that have happened to your tissue. In terms of sample preparation, you have to keep in mind that pretty much all protocols use PCR at some point, even when you don't think you are. Um, PCR, if you don't know how it works, maybe not so important, but just keep in mind it, require, it results in exponential increase in the number of copies of whatever it's supposed to be copying. And sometimes it copies things it's not supposed to be copying, which means that you have to actively try to prevent cross-contamination. Um, it only takes one molecule to contaminate, um, so it means that you need to have negative controls. It also means that you need to be clean in the lab, um, and, you know, try to keep your reagents pure, et cetera. And this is sort of added on to the slide, but I just want to point out that PCR failure isn't necessarily diagnostic. Um, you see some assays that claim it is. It could be that the thing isn't there, or it could be that the person doing it is incompetent. You don't really know. So don't rely on assays that use PCR failure. Um, even if you don't think you're doing PCR, like, say, next-gen sequencing, you're using one of the non-amplified kits to do the library prep, well, as soon as you put the prepped material onto the sequencer, it's doing PCR in order to coat the beads to do the sequencing. So really, no matter what, you're doing PCR. Remember that. Now, let's say you have some sequences. I know that there are various... Um, companies that will provide you with DNA identifications, some of which provide you with more data than others. And I would argue that if the company can't provide you something that looks vaguely like this, which is to say all the references plus um, the thing that you're actually trying to identify with some indication of which bases tell them apart, um, in this case these two and hot pink there, um, you really can't be sure that what they're doing is science. They could have just made up the data for that matter. So make sure that you see something like this. With next-gen sequencing, it's going to be a lot longer, you know, many more columns, but it's going to be the same thing. So you can actually tell that your sample contains the right thing or not um, based on those particular positions. Now, if you're trying to publish a paper, you can show the slide that I just showed you and the reviewers might take it, they might not. Usually you have to run it through some sort of algorithm. And if you're dealing with next-gen sequencing where you have a whole lot of data, you really have to run it through an algorithm because it's too much to do by inspection alone. And these are some general comments about the algorithms because there are, at this point, more than 100 that you can choose from to do this. Um, so choose an algorithm that avoids alignment. 
That's because alignment failure, generally speaking, is common. And when it's automated, it's very difficult to detect. So what I would recommend instead is use a pseudo-alignment of short segments. And those short segments are usually called camers. And you would hope for exact matches between camers and your references and your query samples. The other important thing is that you need to make sure that you use an algorithm that has taxa as terminals. And the reason why I say that is that if there's variation within a species, you need to know about that variation. And that variation needs to be incorporated into the algorithm explicitly. Um, there are some algorithms that try to estimate inter and intra taxon variation, usually using some distribution which applies to some species and not all species. And usually you don't know if your species falls into that particular category. So I would recommend just avoiding using those algorithms because they have a high failure rate. Um, they work really well when they work, but you don't necessarily know when they're going to fail. And as I showed you on the previous slide, if you can, you want unique characteristics. If there's some unique characteristics you can point out, um, your identification is usually much better. This um, somewhat provocatively titled slide is not meant to be an indictment of the program itself. It's more the people who use it. Um, it, BLAST is a wonderful program, but it was not really designed to do this particular task. Um, it was not designed for DNA identification, and the people who do it with that tend to not understand what the output means. And as a result, they misinterpret things and give you conclusions that are not true, um, and you can see that from the data. There are several papers I could point to, but I don't want to embarrass people. Not that I think any of them are in this room, but still, you know. Um, the first thing about BLAST is that you have to realize that it returns a bunch of results with the same score. Now, these results are ordered arbitrarily. It's the order in which it encountered them in the database. It means nothing. So something higher or lower with two things with the same score doesn't mean anything, even though people often kind of indicate that it does. The other thing is that there are numerous weights that the program uses. If you change the weights from the default, you get different answers. This is supposed to be good, um, so you can find other sequences. That's what BLAST is designed to do. But for DNA identification, you have to be very careful because it will give you a different answer. And you know, maybe it's not an answer you want to see, or maybe it's an answer you should see. But either way, you have to know what the weights are that are involved. Basically, if someone hands you BLAST output, I would say that if it's anything other than an exact full-length match, be very suspicious of it. Not to say it's wrong. It could be right. but don't just take it at face value when handed that output. Generally speaking, I would say Kamer matching works better, and I'll try to illustrate that in the next slide. Um, and also, Kamer matching comes in two flavors, one where there's a penalty for absence and one where there's not. And the one where there is not actually is the better choice. So this is a bunch of real data. There's RBCL on the top, Matt K on the bottom in blue, and in the middle, there are both sets of sequences. And there are a whole bunch of algorithms. Basically, the further they are towards 100, the better they are. Um, and if we look, here is the typical implementation of BLAST. You can see it does OK, um, but it's not the leader by any stretch. And you'll also notice that when we combine data, if we're looking at more than one marker, um, which is usually what you're doing with this sort of thing, it actually does worse than you would expect. It doesn't, um, it averages the results. Now. If we look at an algorithm here that uses Kamer matching, you can see it actually performs about the same or much better, especially when it comes to um, looking at um, sequences where there's more than one marker involved. There's another one that uses Kamer matching here, and that's in the silver um, circles. And you can see it performs better. In this case, this is because there's complete data. I made a data set with absolutely no missing data. And this particular algorithm has a penalty for absence. And so that penalty actually pays off in this case, and it works better. However, as soon as you have any missing data in the data set, it performs much, much worse. So if you think you have no missing data, go for it. But if you're not sure or don't know, stick with the Kamer matching that doesn't have that penalty because it keeps its good performance um, even when there is missing data. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and if there's time, I'll answer questions.
Okay, we, we have time for one or two quick questions before we go on to our next speaker. So that was a really great talk, Damon. I do have <clears throat> one general question about the way you, you present sort of two approaches to assay design. One is targeted um, and one is not targeted. The, the, the not targeted one, we could call that agnostic. Mm -hmm. and, and you said that um, it, it's, it's difficult and I assume uh, or problematic because we don't have all the plants, right? Is that the, the foundation behind that? Yes. It's that we that we don't know all of the things that we could encounter in the assay, yes. So, I mean, there is a whole area where they are very vigorously, very aggressively pursuing that kind of agnostic approach, basically in the metagenomics world, particularly an example of that is human microbiome. And one of the ways that they get around, and I welcome your, your comment on this, but one of the ways they get around for the fact that with human microbiome, they do not have references for all the possible bacteria they could run into. There's a lot of diversity there. So what they do is they, when they run into things that are, that are unknown, they, they assign it to a higher taxonomic level. And the reason that's relevant um, is you at least get a snapshot of everything that's there, even if you can't nail exactly what it is. And the reason that's relevant in contrast with the first assay is I can make an assay for ginkgo, really, really good for ginkgo. If I test something that's half ginkgo and half sawdust, my assay will say, it's got ginkgo. And that's all it will tell me. And unless I do an assay in parallel to do sawdust, I'll never see it. So if, if part of the, the thing you want to know is the complete set of what's there, and even if I can't absolutely nail to the species level everything that's present, Operation B might yet still be a viable strategy. No, I agree that you can list, um, shall we say, things that are not there in terms of, you know, I have 80% of the DNA in my sample is one species and the rest of it is something else. Um, and in some cases that might be a good enough answer depending on what you're trying to do. Um, if you need to put those other 20% on a label, you might be in trouble though, you know. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Damon. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask that we hold the questions until the, the, the end so we can move on and keep on schedule. We don't want to hold you from your coffee break at 3.15. Okay. So our next speaker is Stephen Newmaster. And we do have two sessions, and there will be time for questions after the second session. Okay, Stephen. Great. Thank you. Where's the slide? Oh, it should be there. I think that's good. Um, thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the OPA committee for inviting me to come. And I'd like to recognize my colleague, uh, Dr. Ragupathy, who's down here, who's worked um, together with me for the last 15 years. And Ragu's often in the trenches um, long through the weekends and as we work. I want to introduce some of the work that we're currently working on in my lab and some of it that relates to other published work with colleagues on the planet. So now that you've had a uh, firm background provided by Damon, I'm going to move to some of the things that are possible, but they certainly aren't validated yet. They're yet to be published. We'll be publishing this over the next six to eight months uh, with my postdoctoral team. And then they have to move into commercialization and validation. So I kind of want to put the caveat that these are some of the things we're working on hypothetically, and we've tested and we have some results to share. And this is all made possible through uh, at the University of Guelph for running this NHP Research Alliance. And we've been reaching out to the industry and asking the industry what types of questions are challenging you. And then we try to come up with different types of tools to be able to identify. It starts with a story that I could show in three pictures. We have materials. Some of them are raw. Some of those materials are processed materials. And we need to put an identity on them. And there starts to be a theme that starts flowing today. We need voucher specimens in herbaria. I'm a trained taxonomist. Uh, I did my botany undergraduate, graduate work all in botany and genetics, and have firm training that you must always go back to a voucher uh, sample. And we've already heard this. Uh, and I, that's the first part that I'll start talking in my talk. And lastly, we need tools that are accessible to the industry. In some cases, we won't be able to create these for certain species. 
plants are very complex. We just heard this. And the approaches that we're advocating right now and that are possible to do are really built on this SAA type approach to be able to say we have an identity for a particular species based on the species complex that is found. We're able to tell them apart, and there's different ways to be able to do this with a tool that you could use in a um, QA, QC setting. And I'll talk about some of these tools that are available. So I'm going to go through and talk about libraries. I want to talk about quality of DNA um, with a graduate student and a PhD student that's working on a project with industry. I want to talk about extracts. These are questions that have been asked. What do we know about them? How does it work for different techniques? How much DNA do we find? One question that's came up in the past, and there isn't clear evidence in the scientific literature, can you tar tell apart leaf from stem, from root, from rhizome? And we have a project that we're working on, and there's several hypothetical ways that you could possibly deal with this. And then I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the uh, NHP Research Alliance. It all starts with a voucher, and these vouchers must capture population variation. You've already heard this, so I won't dwell on it. This is a huge task. At the University of Guelph, when we started doing DNA barcoding, and several of us in the room worked on this for well over a decade. We started in 2003, and we collected many plants, and they went into the herbaria, and we barcoded these different regions. It's a huge task. You collect the sample. The sample must be dried, pressed. You have a geographic origin. Some of them, hopefully all of them, you have known provenance. All of this goes into a database. It's all recorded. We want to create this and work with you in the industry and academics, botanical gardens, to have a public database that's available. It'd be available for regulatory, be available for industry. And the only way we're going to be able to do this is to be able to work together. We need to have deep sampling in populations to understand how much variation there is in the populations. And we need to do this for every single species that you've commoditized. And there's several hundred of them. The good news is there's only 50 to 60 of them that uh, capture 80% of your commoditized market. We need to move away from DNA barcoding. Uh, unfortunately, my university doesn't like me talking about this. It's antiquated. It's, an, it's not the appropriate technology for you. You've heard several reasons uh, that Damon just shared with you. One of them that I would like to point out is by definition, we have two regions that we use. We have specific primers that go in and snip that give you a very long read. And you'll find out in a few minutes, when we look at different types of processing and we start binning, what are the sizes of fragments that you find? They're very small. They're between 80 and 120 base pairs. And those are not barcode regions by definition. Uh, so you just don't find them in your products. So we're moving to new techniques. We need to find mini sequences, or we need to find SNPs that differentiate this variation within and among species. And one way to do that is some targeted genome scanning. Uh, or genome skinning, skimming, where we look at um, chloroplast DNA, plastid DNA, and we look into also nuclear DNA, and we pick some target, targeted areas of that genomic area, and we put it into the database so that people can start to work on these and use this data in many different types of data analysis that could be targeted onto a qPCR machine, or perhaps they could be used in a next-gen approach. At the same time, we need a validation uh, method that builds on analytical chemistry. If you're collecting all these vouchers, why not run some analytical chemistry? And there's many different ways that we could use it. And I've talked to the analytical chemistry um, people. Some of them are in this crowd here. And we figured that one of the best ways to do this is to build an NMR database, chemical fingerprint uh, database. So we're starting to work on this. National Research Council is working with us um, and a number of different colleagues. And it certainly isn't my area, but it's certainly uh, very interesting, built on multivariate statistics, which I really appreciate. So in the populations that start to come out, we see a mix between now uh, the genomics and analytical chemistry and the manuscripts for separating these populations and these species that are closely related for ingredients that are found. And this will be a theme that you start to see and something that we advocate. So here's the first set of data I want to share with you. We have 1,242 samples that were collected from the industry, and we're interested in what is the quality and quantity of, of um, DNA in these products across a spectrum of different types of manufacturing processes. And then we took that data, because it's kind of on two different, two different planes. We have quantity and we have quality. We did a, a multivariate analysis on it, which I'll share with you in a moment. Um, so this is Adam Fowler. 
Adam uh, is working on a project with Herbalife right now. He spent part of his summer at the Changsha facility in China. And we set up experimental designs to follow fresh material for several species all the way through the processing. And he has a number of different questions in his PhD, and I'm just sharing a little bit of it today. Here's an example of going through processing. This is Camilla sinensis, so this is green tea. As we go from fresh material where we get nice quality DNA, and it goes through some processing, it goes through treatment for sanitization. It could be heat treating, and you end up with some extract process in the end. And there's a number of different types of techniques that we need to consider that I'm popping on the screen right now. And this is not exhaustive, but these are the types of um, treatments that we have considered in this experimental design that Adam's working on. We look through the lens of different types of dependent factors to understand quality and quantity of DNA. It's not just one thing that we could say, oh, this helps us to give a really good indicator of the quality or quantity of DNA. We have several different lenses that we could look through. Um, it includes just measuring on a qubit, on a fluorometer. And qubit is the, is the brand of one of the fluorometers that we use and the amount of DNA that's found in a product. It gives you a lot of evidence of how much DNA is there. I think it's very important information every time you do a test to uh, have a fluorometer reading. You may have an extract and find out it's at zero, or really it's called below scale, and there isn't even any DNA there. Sometimes you can still sequence when you actually do have zero uh, fluorometer readings, but it gives you an idea of quantity. Um, Comet assays are kind of quick gel reads to look at the quality of DNA, and it's kind of semi-qualitative. Uh, Bioanalyzer data I'm going to show right now for fragment size. And then the other methods that I have here are something that uh, Adam's working on, but I don't have data to show you. So the data that I do have to show you is based on the fragment size and the amount of DNA based across all these 1,242 samples. If we look at it, we look at the variance in samples, they fall into different clusters. And this is non-metric multidimensional scaling to be able to ordinate this data. If you're not familiar with ordination analysis, the dots that are found on here, and there would be 1,200 of them, if they're all close together, the hypothesis is there's no variation, there's no difference. And this could be in a community ecology uh, survey where you're looking to see whether or not all the same species are found in one community. Or it could be variance among different products. There's many different ways to use uh, this, techno or this analysis. So in here, we have the fragment size, and we have quantity, and it's different. There's variation. And these dots fall into different clouds, and these clouds have statistical differences between them, which have been measured using a number of different techniques. And the interesting thing is that leaves are different from powder. Powder is different from uh, sterilization. And sterilization includes a number of different treatments that's probably explained some of the variability that's found there. Certainly steam treatment's one of them. And then extracts is found in a different cloud, so it forms a classification. We can look at the correlation with different factors that we measured onto uh, this ordination based on different planes in the ordination. So this is multi-dimensional space. This is actually a, a two-dimensional. The third dimension didn't have any any variation in it. And we can see that we have longer fragments that are found in leaves and shorter fragments in, ac in extracts. Now, that seems probably very obvious to you, but this is some of the first quantitative evidence that we have to actually show a model that this is true. And it's information that's good to know. DNA quantity is separated out on a second axis. And it gives us some idea of, of the differences between different processing as we move along. The second thing that we did is look at success from all of these samples as we started to run them. So we ran them through DNA barcoding, and we had success in that first assay to say, is the species that's found that we tested across these different species, there's like six of them that we used in this example that's coming across here, common commoditized species. What was the success in actually saying that that ingredient was found across all of these? And we went from raw material, and it was processed, and then we measured it again. So it's an actual experimental design. And you can see how this starts to fall off in sequence success for DNA barcoding. And this is based on the classic uh, two-region DNA barcoding markers that we have. Next-gen sequencing, we had better results as we moved along. Now keep in mind, this is only for a few samples. So this success could change if I changed up the species that we're looking at and the species resolution that we have for those exact species. But it is much better than the DNA barcoding. We've got some decent results, including some results for extracts, 
which a lot of people are surprised, but remember, in extracts, there's still some DNA. It's found in shorter sequences, and they can be reproduced. And it's matching to that first assay where we're just saying the ingredient is found in that product. We can focus in on a mini-sequence library, which could be applied back to NextGen. And the NextGen result that I just showed you was using barcode regions which were longer, so we could increase NextGen. And we're probably quite similar numbers that are found in there. So the next gen's a platform. Um, but these mini sequence barcodes then, which are very short, 80 to 120 base pair, if we use that as our library, and we go through this experimental design of looking at different processing, remember this is the exact same material, we, we measured it and then went through steam treatment and all the way down to extracts, the same material going through the process, you can see the success. And it's very similar, uh, much um, similar results if we move to some type of uh, nucleotide signature on probes, whether we use that in some microarray system or we move that into a, P a qPCR machine. And we ended up getting fairly high success. So, so far to date, on an, every, um, on an average year, we're running about 3,000 natural health product samples at our facility. And in that facility, if we just look at the number of extracts that move th through, we're somewhere between 65 and 70% of extracts, we're getting a match on that first assay. Oh yeah, it's an extract of ginkgo, and it matches to a positive with ginkgo. Here's the next results that I want to share with you. So this is Prasad working in the lab, and his question is, can you tell the difference between DNA found between, on the same species, between leaves, stems, and roots. And if you move into the literature, there's already some evidence to start to build some hypothesis. And the first evidence is to say, well, why not look at RNA? RNA is a method that could tell apart different plant parts. Um, there are some other hypotheses that you could start to look at. One of them was a number of work that we did on uh, genome size and looking at endoreduplication or ploidy levels within a plant. And you do see different uh, endoreduplication endo levels between stem and leaves and roots. I'm not showing some of that data today, but it would be another approach. But what Prasad did was, was to uh, ask the question whether or not we get different types of reproducible RNA sequences from different parts of the plant. And he's been able to do this, change it over to copy DNA, look for specific sequences. And the first example that I have is ashwagandha. And we had samples that came from an industry partner. Uh, you know, the KSM, everybody's familiar with it. You saw it as you're coming through this week if you're down on the main floor. And we had many samples where we were comparing in the leaves with the stem and the root. And, um, or the rhizomes in this case. And you can see here we have specific areas in the RNA or in the copy DNA where we could find a signature that separated these out. And uh, this is based on a population size of about 30. Hanan's experiments are looking at microbe diversity or in microbiome. If you look at microbiome diversity in plants, there's endophytic fungi, endophytic bacteria, there's viruses. They're different on different parts of the plant. They're different in different communities. They're different in different biogeographic origins. And there's been a number of papers that have been published to show that you can move back and look at different, not only different varieties, but different bio, uh, biogeographic origin of plants based on these biomes. And the question that we were asking, and this has already been published in several places in the literature, is perhaps there's different microbiomes associated with different parts of the plant. You could think about it, different communities of organisms are, that are found on different parts of our body, and there would be different reasons that they would be there. So in Genko, Hanan ran this on a next-gen platform, and she came back with a suite of diversity that was found throughout the plant. And the question to ask from sampling the different parts of the plant over and over is, how well did you sample them? So this is a species area curve and sampling reads to see whether or not we've sampled the different parts of the plant very well. And as they level off, it ends up being a sample area curve that's being saturated, so the question is yes. We've done that. And the next part is, do we actually have unique species assemblages or communities that are differentiated in different parts of the plant? And the answer to that is yes. As we look through here and we see the variability found between leaf, root, and stem, there are different areas of the biome that identify different microbes that associate in communities. The next question is, well, what if you do that 10 times? 
do you replicate it? Or perhaps every single time you do it, you get a unique community. So you could tell everything apart, which is pretty useless for it because we can't reproduce. We were able to do this uh, again 30 times and we got the exact same results coming back with communities. And the best way to deal with this is put all the data into multivariate ordination and see whether or not these communities separated. So again, ordination analysis, and you can see all of these different dots on here. They're not all in one place. So it's not as if all of the uh, micro microbes are found the same through all different parts of the plant. They're separated in ordination space. They're st st statistically relevant in how they're separated as well. And that data I'm not showing on here, but the clouds I can identify as root, stem, and leaf. And this is with the uh, ginkgo sample. If I back up just a little bit for a moment, you might say, well, what's the point with um, ginkgo? Maybe it's not the, the best example to tell apart because why would you even care if there's a difference between root, stem, or leaf? If you look at this label here, and I should have mentioned this when I went through it, it says ginkgo biloba extract, and it has ginkgo biloba leaf. This came from a ginkgo biloba leaf. Whether it really matters or not, we we're able to tell whether or not there was root material or stem material mixed in with the leaf material. Now, this has not been validated, hasn't been published, and this is not, certainly hasn't been commercialized. This is the first evidence to say it's plausible that this could be done. And as this moves through peer review and we re reproduce this, this may be a tool that could be available for you. Ashwagandha, we had these samples. We looked at the microbiome in ashwagandha, again, through uh, different parts of the plant. There's variability. There's different markers that show the variability in the community assemblage across different parts of the plant. And once again, we have an ordination analysis that separates out the different parts that are found based on microbiodiversity. As we start to build out these tools, especially with a targeted approach, and I certainly agree with Damon that we may be in a position to work on a targeted approach if we build good libraries, there's a caveat. We're not in the position to start looking at what of everything is found in the plants, which is a say number two. We're moving closely with algorithms, and we may be in that position in two or three years, but until we have excellent libraries that give us good statistical power in our model, we're not there yet. Certainly, we're not there yet in, in our lab. Um, but what we can do is have a target approach to say, well, is ginkgo found in the product, and have a simple test. And we're moving that test onto a PCR platform that could just give you an area curve you could also put that into a, a microarray or into a next-gen platform as well to have a positive. What we want to be able to do is have tests that are reliable and tests that could be done at a, a, an, a level for industry that is affordable and also gives you data promptly. And I think the best way to do that is to have small instruments that are found throughout the supply chain and to test more often and to start testing every batch. So the vision is to move toward this technology so that we can test all the way from producers into the supply chain into manufacturing. At some point, the data won't be uh, reproducible because we won't be able to get DNA from some extracts. But at least the step before, we'll have some evidence that we had a positive match. And then that data could be shared with a number of different organizations, certainly companies like yourself, for who are in here, and some regulatory oversight would be able to look at that and use this as a screening tool. It doesn't, re it doesn't replace analytical chemistry, but it becomes another tool in the toolbox to say, well, we do have a positive match to say that there's some DNA there from a sp an ingredient like ginkgo. So the NHP Research Alliance is reaching out to share this data with you. We want to work together to get samples, build libraries, work with herbaria, work with botanical gardens, work with regulators, share these libraries back so that together we can have enough samples to come in. Our goal is hundreds of thousands of samples for the two or three hundred species that we have out there. And we're moving pretty quickly to start to assembling these libraries and there's lots of specimens moving in. And to date, in the past year, we've run 3,000 uh, different industry samples through the test and have uh, lots of positive results from that. We have industry that has stepped up and said, well, we'll give you access to producers and farms. And Natrix is an excellent example where our botanists are being 
We can put them on planes, we can fly them to sites, we can have samples come in, which are raw plant materials that we can build excellent vouchers, we can do NMR on them, we can do genome scans and skimming to be able to build data that we can share with everybody. And we're doing this for many different species. And of course, for everyone, there's a voucher, there's a geographic coordinate, there's a known provenance of where it came from, and we build this for many populations as we start to build. And this is an example of one company that's moved up, and there are several companies that have kind of stepped up to say, well, we'll give you access as well. At the same time, we start working with botanical gardens, and we start working with museums in Herbaria. In our area, we don't, it's, not, it's not like New York Botanic Gardens, but we do have 200,000 uh, samples that are all agricultural re relevant species. And we are now doing DNA extractions on them and building libraries as well. And we want to be able to share this. This is a vision as we start to move forward. And it's going to take some time, but we want to be able to share it with everybody that's here and, and beyond. Back up. Thank you. So we do, in fact, have 10 minutes for questions, uh, which is a good thing. So we'll start down here. You had a question at the beginning. We'll get to you in a second, Stacey. Hang on just a second. It could be for either of us. Yeah. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. The excellent, really enjoyed both talks. My question and a comment at the same time. There are, I have seen at least 25, 30 different companies who are marketing that they have total GNA testing. When I looked at them, this is the comment, when I looked them at a HPTLC, I could use Wagner's book and say that it is from uh, root and uh, uh, not from the leaves. So how, how, in your opinion, how can we really trust, especially in the case of GMPs, when vendor qualification is becoming more and more important? I'm not sure if you want to respond, Damon, but I'll, I'll start by responding with one thing that we've just shared with you today and one thing we certainly agree on is for, say, one, is this ingredient found in the product? It can be possible for those species where we understand the resolution of intra and intraspecific variation, how much population variation there is in that species and where the closely related species rely. And those publications that a number of people have published, certainly you've published, Damon, on some species, we have that. We understand the SNPs, and we can make a test that's reliable. That's what we can do now. That's it. We can't quantitate. We can't tell you everything that's there. That could be done. It's a possibility, but we don't have that available yet. But we can, for some species, we can tell you that the ingredient is there, especially at raw material. My advice is um, buy a qubit, fluorometer. They're cheap. They're easy to use. You can do a measurement and find out that you have no DNA. It's zero. Um, why send it off to have a DNA analysis when there's zero DNA? And you have your, your product. You have your extracts. Um, I would say do that or send it somewhere someone who does. Um, I know when we do testing, that's the first test we run. And then we could go back to the industry who we're working with and say, you don't have any DNA in this particular product. Um, I'd just add um, to that that um, y you don't even really have to go as high-tech as a qubit, not that it's particularly high-tech, but an agarose gel will tell you pretty much what you need to know whether there's mm -hmm. something there or not and whether it's worth doing an assay. Yeah. Hi. I, um, you guys are clearly doing a lot of work, and you have a lot of funding, and you have a lot of data, and... I would like you to convince me that there's value in all of that that's being done. And here's my specific question. Um, you're looking at DNA. From, from a food standpoint, what we care about is not the DMA. We care about the chemical composition. In terms of testing, I was at a fish and wildlife lab a few weeks ago where a guy literally took a piece of plant material, put it in the time of flight mass spec, and had an answer in five minutes. Why would DNA, I mean, what we, you're already collecting the NMR data, that's great. That's the kind of data that we actually care about and is actually useful to us from, from a quality standpoint. 
and from an identity standpoint. Why would we bother with DNA? Why should we be bothering with DNA when what we actually care about is the chemical composition? So, um, one short answer is that these labels have to specify plant material, and one can get these chemicals from places other than plants, and so that's part of the reason why one should care about it. Um, I would also argue that every single testing method, if you understand it, can be faked. Um, and so if someone understands how to fake NMR data, for instance, um, I'm not one of them, but I know there are people who can, um, you know, it's a second method that you also have to understand to pass um, for quality control. Clearly, the industry, I mean, we've all done, you've all seen papers, we've all done tests where there are samples that get through supposedly great quality control that are not what they're supposed to be. So, I mean... Um, yes, except for the label doesn't say it's the chemical composition. The label says it's this plant. Which is a big difference. Right. That's actually a really good point. And, and what I've been pointing it out, and actually, when I when I teach my fourth year class in uh, evolutionary biology, and we start talking about this testing, the chemical test identifies the chemical. That's what it does. And we're going to hear much more in the afternoon about fit for purpose. So if your test is to say, is this chemical found in my product, you do the chemical test and you have a result. And you have variability around that result and you have confidence around that result. If your question is species A found in a product, then you need to consider a test that considers all the types of um, evolutionary biology and heritability that Damon was talking about earlier. This variation among species and how species have evolved and how they're related to each other. That's not a chemical test. Chemistry cannot do that. Chemistry does not have, it can be have through you know, inferred mechanisms in heritability, but this is found through a genetic process in evolutionary biology. So that's a genetic test then that relates back to our ideas of species concepts and it gets back to, oh, ginkgo biloba and it's found in the ingredients. So that would be a test for identity identity of a species. There may be correlates with the chemistry back to this test. They may be really high. And it may be much cheaper to do this. And you may have great confidence in those correlations. And that, that may be fit for purpose for you. Well, you just totally changed my question, Dr. Newmaster. Because <laughs> I'm going to go next. Because <laughs> I had a totally different comment and question to make. But um, maybe it's part of the DNA genetics. I'm not sure I entirely agree with you. Because the at the end of the day, what we're talking about is identity specifications and compliance with GMP. And you are required to set a specification for identity, and that identity is, is the plant part, right? And the right plant, the gene, like the genus and species, or to show that it's derived from the right genus, species, and the right plant part, right? Plants are not named based on their DNA content, though. Right, so from my perspective, the most fit for purpose method is always gonna be visual inspection by a botanist in the field. Oh, sure. <laughs> right, I mean, that's, that's it. So, so I think we need to keep that perspective when we're having these discussions. Um, I also throw out that, that building chemometric models suffer from the same things. I totally appreciate um, Dr. Little when you were talking about whether you used BLAST or, or Chimer and getting different results because that, is what a lot of people forget in their validation process, that, that data analysis, data processing, and that's also true for chemical chemometric models, right? Like a lot of them are thrown out there. The actual question I had was about um, what I understood from, from Damon's talk was that if you are doing barcoding and you're going linking to, to GenBank, there is a vetting process, there is a standard, there is a quality standard, and it's different than just the masses of, of data that are contributed there. But then I heard Stephen say that barcoding isn't the best, isn't the right way to go about it. Um, but it seems to me that it is the only one that actually has a vetted reference. <laughs> so, I mean, can someone kind of clarify for me that? Because I didn't hear Damon say that barcoding wasn't a good idea. I didn't actually get that yeah. from his talk. 
Um, I got that there at least was a standard there, which I really was happy to hear. And then after you answer that, Damon, maybe Stephen, you can comment on how your, what criteria you're developing for this plan to generate your database of sure. information for reference. Why don't you start? Uh, sure, I actually want to answer the question you didn't ask first, which is that you, the name of a plant is actually tied to a specimen. And so everything that specimen has is in the description, essentially. So the DNA is part of it, as is the chemistry, as is the, um, we try to be holistic. Um, to answer your question, yes, barcoding, well, I should say this. GenBank is sort of like Wikipedia. Anyone can submit sequences. I could, in a few minutes on my phone, submit some sequences that I've just made up, and they will end up in GenBank. Um, now, they may get taken out eventually when someone realizes I just said I made them up, but, you know, they'll, they'll be there for a while. Um, so the idea of barcoding is that it has a set of standards for what gets that tag in GenBank. That's not to say other sequences in GenBank can't also meet those standards, can't also deposit their raw data, can't also have a voucher associated with them. There are plenty of sequences that have those things that are not barcode records because they're the wrong part of the genome or they weren't intended to be part of a barcoding study, but were submitted with that. And so if you look, GenBank has a lot of tags, and one of the tags, it'll say specimen voucher, and then there will be a reference to a specimen, usually collector, collection number, herbarium that it's deposited in. Um, and then sometimes there's a link, you can just click on it and see a picture of it, sometimes not, those don't always work, but. They're there, um, and they can be for any sequence if someone cares to submit them. And they work nicely on fresh samples. The problem in processed samples and the binning that we did on a, on a, on a very big database of over 1,000 is it quickly drops down with even just grinding a sample to 80 to 120 base pairs. So by definition for DNA barcoding, and we wrote these in the papers, it's four or 500 base pairs. They're just not there in very large amounts. So being able to, you're just gonna have a lot of failures. And when we ran these samples, we saw that. We saw lots of failures. And it happens. It goes in and it looks for long sequence reads to be able to reproduce and sequence them. And they're not there. They're broken up into small sequences. So what I advocate is we have these samples and we can go back and fairly quickly, especially from fresh samples of known provenance, provenance, we can create smaller sequences, sequence reads. Actually, a better way to do it is back up and have some genome scanning where we can look at long or short sequence reads it would be the best way. But the ideal thing to have is shorter sequence areas that show differences between closely related species or distantly related species so we can make a test that works very quickly. I agree. Other questions? Question Stefan. here. Here. Oh, oh yes. sorry. Joe, Joe asked me to ask a very quick question. So if you, if you could give just yes or no answer, that, I think that would also help very much. Yeah. Now, the question is whether there can be some common denominators across the different methods. We heard about barcoding, NGS, LAMP, whatnot. Um, so can you have some common denominators so that um, th we, we, could, we could have some common expectation and when there is a test performed by somebody, the false negatives are excluded, false positives are excluded, and they get what they can get, what, what, what is right answer. So is it possible? I can go. Yeah, can go. I was going to say, I think the answer is yes if I fully understand your question. <laughs> I, I think the answer is yes, and the place to have it is in one library we can all work from. And if that comes from a bigger scan of the genome, then we can all work on different technologies from that, and it comes back to a reference standard. But there's one place we're working from. That could include good GenBank data. It could. But we need to create uh, a more robust. There's not a lot of population density in when I go and look in GenBank for barcode uh, regions that are really long or whole genome reads. Uh, they're just not there. We need that data. Um, given the fact that you're having to um, work in uh, smaller fragments, um, it's easier in some ways to differentiate ginkgo, evolutionarily speaking. How about something where you have introgression, like in echinacea, you've got the limits yeah. of the small fragments. Um, every method has limits. Can you speak to that? 
Sure, it's a, this is the bad news of plants that we heard about this morning. <laughs> this is a species by species by species solution. And for some species, like Salix, and I see this on the bottle, Salix alba, and if I do a test, I come back to the industry and I go, I'm sorry, but it's Salix SP. It's, uh, we don't know what it is. We don't have a test because there's hybridization, there's integration, there's all types of mechanisms that you can't separate Salix or um, Hawthorne, Critigus, and I could go on and on. There's different complexes we don't know very well. Um, there are other ones that we do. It's certainly a species by species by species solution. I would just add to that that when you have a problem that involves a lot of integration, you need multiple loci to sort out what you're dealing with, so multiple small fragments rather than just one small fragment is what you need. Yeah, and hence the need for a nice genome scan so you could go in and pick them. And as we get better and better uh, multivariate models or tools to be able to look at, and we've heard about some of them today, uh, David Erickson is working on what as well, we'd be able to go in and mine that data and go in and find the right fragments. Eventually this is going to go onto a, you know, a microarray trip, it's a chip, it's going to be on microfluidics, it's going to be a very small device. We know this is possible because we're doing it in foodborne pathogens right now, it's already happening in blood testing. We're just taking this technology and moving it into botanicals. Uh, quick question here. I see a lot of uh, databases being developed in Asia, in China in particular. Uh, is there any efforts to collaborate and merge some of their data with the data that you have in Guelph? And the other question to Damon, uh, you, you, you made me a little bit worried about the quality of the publications on genetic identification methods. What are some of the red flags for a poor publication that I should be aware of? Yeah, so for building databases, um, one of the things I've been doing over the last year is flying all over the place and talking to these people who own other databases and say, hey, look, why can't we just work together and put it because we have to go species by species, that earlier comment, why don't we put all of this data together and make it public so we can all work? And people have put barriers up in the past. We do that very well in humanity. And the resounding kind of feedback that I'm getting from all these organizations are, let's do it. So lately, we've signed up um, Chinese Institute of Medicine, Chinese Materia Medica, and they're donating data into a big um, database that we'll all have access to and in different ways. And you may have to sign on to one and on to another, but there will be some ways of connecting these within the different databases. And we're talking about how to do that right now. We have a large Ayurvedic database in India that's going to be joining in with the database that we're building. And we could build it into databases that sit in different botanical gardens. Uh, and we have the computing power to be able to do this. And we just need to start talking and joining it. The nice thing that I'm hearing from these different organizations is like, yeah, let's start sharing data. Okay. So red flags, um, small sample sizes, particularly numbers less than 10 for the target, target species, um, lack of any kind of reference to a phylogeny or a explained sampling strategy, um, lack of discussion of sequence quality for the references, um, lack of depositing sequences, sometimes that happens as well. And then there are a number of methods that are, seem to be published where they say, here's the assay, but they don't actually demonstrate it on samples that are other than the ones used to make this assay from, or hypothetically in most cases. Okay. So thank you. That we'll, we'll end the questions there. I think I, I let the questions run a little bit longer and, uh, and cut into your coffee time, but I think the questions and answers are as valuable as the, the podium presentation. So thank you.